this chapter of our 454 engine swap project begins with the cooling system. We'll be starting off with a few small things like changing out this plug for a 5 8 of an inch hose barb. This in conjunction with a 90 degree angled fitting in the intake manifold will act as our external cooling system bypass. The purpose of which is to aid in coolant flow within the engine while the thermostat is still closed. Now, of course, it'll need a hose to do so, but we'll take care of that after we figure out the thermostat housing. This one was inexpensive, easy to get my hands on, should be facing the right direction, and has threaded ports, one of which we're going to need. The intake manifold is only set up with one threaded port into the coolant passage, which we're already using for our coolant bypass, so we'll need another for this temperature switch. It's an exact match for the one currently installed on the car, used to turn the radiator fans on and off automatically. This particular switch is rated to close at 200 degrees and open at 185, and that's certainly something we can test. We'll suspend the switch in a pot of water on the stove and turn up the heat. We'll watch the meter until we have continuity, and there it is, right at 203.5 degrees. Then we'll take the pot off of the burner and let the temperature naturally decrease until the switch opens again, which happens right at 195 degrees. That's a little bit higher than what the switch is rated for, but it should still play nice with our 180 degree thermostat. Since we're running a supposedly high volume water pump, we should probably pair that with a supposedly high flow thermostat. This one sold by Summit appears to just be a repackaged Motorrad thermostat, but it should be a decent one, and the inclusion of a jiggle valve is always nice to help keep air pockets from forming. It's rated at 180 degrees, which means that's when it should start opening, and I don't have any reason to disbelieve that, but it should still be fun to see it in action. And what do you know, we do start to see motion right at 180 degrees. And by the time the thermometer reads 205, it appears to be fully open. We'll turn the burner off, and we can see it's starting to close right about 195 degrees. As the temperature drops, it continues closing and is fully shut just below 180. We repeated the test one more time, and the results remain the same. So the radiator fans shouldn't come on until the thermostat is already fully open, and they should shut off when it's in its normal operating range. Before installing anything, we'll test fit the thermostat housing, and it's a good thing we did because there is a clearance problem with this bolt that we're using for the supercharger idler. We'll need to trim back both the thermostat housing and the standoff for that bolt. The housing is easy enough to modify thanks to the belt sander. That gives us a comfortable amount of room to thread in a bolt, but we still need to clearance the standoff to fit around the housing. We'll take care of that by cutting a notch out of the end using the angle grinder. And once all of that's been smoothed over, we're ready to install the thermostat housing for real. We'll start with a ring of RTV around the port on both the intake and housing sides. Then we can slot the thermostat into the intake manifold, making sure that the jiggle valve is facing up. Over top of that goes our gasket, which the RTV will hold in place. Both of the housing bolts will get a coat of anti-seize, and this upper one has to be a very specific length so it doesn't run into the threads for the supercharger mounting bolt. With those through the thermostat housing, we'll thread them into the intake and snug both down. Before fully tightening, we'll double check our bracket spacer, and since it seems like that will fit just fine, we'll torque the housing down to 15 foot-pounds. With that fully installed, we'll thread a plug into the lower port, and our temperature switch into the upper port using thread sealer on both. That switch installed pretty far, but luckily isn't touching the thermostat, so we should be just fine. Next, we're going to bolt back on the supercharger idler bracket, which has been on and off for test fitting, but hasn't really been properly installed. To get it looking nice and shiny, we'll give it a WD-40 and red scotch Bright polish. Then we'll bring it over to the engine and start dropping in bolts. We're using anti-seize between the bolts and the aluminum sleeves, and thread sealer where needed. 
we'll get each and every one of those started and then tighten them down in a few cycles with a final torque of 30 foot-pounds. Following that, we'll get ready to install the idler pulley using a 5 8 of an inch bolt in our two custom washers. That will get threaded into the backing nut and let us tighten down the whole pulley assembly. Now that all those parts are in place, we can recheck clearance for our coolant bypass hose, of which there is none. We could run this hose over the thermostat housing and into that vertical barb, but I decided to instead just use a second angled barb fitting, which unfortunately means we have to remove the water pump pulley. We'll break the bolts loose, spin them off, and now we should have plenty of room to install that angled barb fitting. Once that's tightened down and facing the right direction, we'll cut our 5 8 of an inch heater hose to length, install it, and clamp both ends. That takes care of that and should leave plenty of clearance for everything else. And once the water pump pulley has been reinstalled, we'll take a look at a different type of pulley. These are all for the supercharger belt drive. Those two lower ones are a 55 and 72 tooth, and I'd like to be able to use both interchangeably on this engine. Our setup uses a two inch belt, which actually measures out to about one and seven eighths inches. Two of these pulleys are made for that width of belt and one is made for a three inch. For our setup, that 72 is definitely going to need a spacer, but the extra width of the 55 tooth actually comes in handy and it looks like it won't need one. That 55 tooth also has a standard six bolt mounting pattern which drops right on to our special balancer pulley. The center register on the 72 tooth is the same, but it's meant to mount with the three standard pulley bolts instead of the six more commonly used on supercharger setups. For interchangeability, strength, and spacer selection, we're going to be re-drilling that 72 tooth pulley to the standard six bolt pattern. We'll use the aftermarket pulley as a guide to mark out the holes to be drilled, center punch each one, and pilot them with a 3 16 of an inch bit. Then we'll go back around and drill those out to 25 64 As a finishing touch, we'll chamfer all the edges so that the pulley is ready to be installed. To get that pulley in line with the supercharger, I had purchased this 1.4 inch spacer, which actually ended up being too long and I later had to get a 0.8 inch as well. But that aside, the pulley fits nicely, and since we polished it up before installing it, it doesn't look half bad either. Despite going through a lot of changes, this engine has remained bolted to its stand since we first disassembled it, so it's a pretty big moment to pick it up with the crane and have it hanging in the air once more. From there, it'll be going back on the engine cradle it came on because it'll make certain things easier to get to. Once we have that bolted on and the engine has been safely grounded, we can take a good look at the setup we have so far. Thanks to the measurements we took, we now have V-belts for all of our accessories, and the only place a belt is close to touching anything is the adjuster bolt for the power steering, and even if it does hit it now and then, it's not going to cause us any trouble. Unlike our next project, which did end up being a bit of a headache, and that's the oil dipstick tube. The engine didn't have one with it when I picked it up, and as it turns out, finding a satisfactory replacement was a bit of a headache. I ended up with this universal set from Spectre, which didn't immediately impress with its quality, but after the dipstick handle has been threadlocked back together, we can see if the tube will work. With a bit of force, it does press in, but we'll definitely have to do some bending to get it routed out of the way of everything else. I also don't trust the level markings, so I found this complete GM dipstick set on eBay that is for this exact engine, and from the picture, measured the length from the flare on the tube to the end of the dipstick. Comparing that to our universal set, we are seeing a full three quarter of an inch difference from the bottom of the seating flare to the fill line on the dipstick. So if we were going by Spectre's reading, we would be overfilling the oil. To correct for this, we'll cut three quarters of an inch off of the end of the tube so that the dipstick can sit down farther. We'll clean up the inside and outside of the tube's cut edge and spray brake cleaner down it before ramrodding a piece of shop towel through with a piece of quarter inch all thread. 
Now, if we measure from the base of the seating flare to the dipstick fill line, we are very close to the GM part. All that's left is to route and mount the tube, but before we can, we've got another unboxing to do. These are the headers that I picked out for the car, or at least the ones I could afford that were actually in stock. They're supposed to fit this engine and chassis combination, though we'll have to wait to find out if that is indeed true. For now, all we can find out is whether they bolt to the engine at all, and the answer is kinda. The exhaust ports and bolt holes do line up, but the flange can't sit flat against the cylinder head because it is hitting the cylinder head bolts. If I had to guess, this is a Gen 5 and 6 engine problem because they use these tall flange head bolts. We'll use tape to mark out the problem areas and introduce the header flange to the grinding wheel. We'll be removing a fair amount of material, but that shouldn't be a problem because the flange is plenty wide. Pretty soon, we have plenty of clearance to each of the cylinder head bolts, and we only have to do the same thing again on the other side. This one involved a bit more guessing because the headers were hitting the engine cradle, but after repeating the same grinding process we did for the passenger side, everything seems like it should be in good shape. It's definitely a good thing that we got the headers to fit nicely, but we were only putting them on the engine so that we could route the dipstick tube around them. To help us lay things out, we'll bolt the bracket to the cylinder head and install a spark plug with the wire. To get the dipstick tube where it seems like it'll fit best, we'll have to rearrange the bracket a bit and start bending the tube so that it hugs along the side of the block better. The rest of this process is a cycle of checking and bending and checking and bending and checking and bending until it seems like we have a decent fit. And I think this is about as good as it's gonna get. Yeah, tightening the bolt under that bracket is a little bit awkward, but not that bad, and overall it seems like a sturdy setup. But we're actually gonna go one step farther and weld the bracket to the tube. We'll start with just a tack weld with it in place, and then go around for a handful more with the tube and the vise. We'll give the welded area a quick coat of paint to hopefully prevent rust, and we should be good to go. I think this style of tube is supposed to use an o-ring underneath the flare to seal it, so when we install this for real, that's what we'll use. And once the bracket is bolted to the cylinder head, the whole thing seems pretty solid. The dipstick itself is perhaps on the snug side, but at least it's not going to go anywhere. And there we go. Other than an o-ring to seal it, that should be the dipstick tube situation sorted out. Which is great, because it means we can finally add oil to this engine and see how badly it leaks. We'll go ahead and pull off the valve covers so that we can make sure oil is getting all the way through the valve train as we run the oil pump. To help the camshaft wear in correctly, we'll be running a full bottle of this zinc engine oil additive. We'll pour that in and mix it all together with some conventional 5W30. Once that entire 5-quart bottle has been poured down into the crankcase, we'll add an oil pressure gauge to keep an eye on things as we run the oil pump. To spin the pump drive shaft, we've got our pre-lube tool, which we will fit onto the power drill and drop into the engine. I've heard before that big block Chevys can be difficult to pre-lube, so I was ready to settle in for the long run, but it only took about 5 seconds before we were building pressure and only a second after that before I was spraying oil onto the floor. It didn't take long to get oil to about half of our rockers, and if we turn the engine over a little bit, we've got it at every single one. To get oil all the way up to the top, the oil pickup, pump, passages, lifters, push rods, and rocker arms all need to be getting along. We'll use a wrench to turn the engine over a few times while running the drill, and it seems like we have good, continuous flow at every one of the rocker arms, so we should probably put the valve covers back on before I dump all of the oil all over the floor. Those bolts will be going in with anti-seize, and we will torque them to 72 inch-pounds. And now that the threat of spraying oil everywhere has been greatly decreased, we can really get the pump spinning to make sure we're getting oil through the entire engine. 
The oil pressure is fantastic and I'm not seeing any leaks, so it looks like we're in great shape. We won't be installing a distributor for a while, so for now the priming tool can stay there and we'll install a hold down clamp on top for kicks. We can also check the oil level since the filter is full and we should be able to get an accurate reading. I guess I shouldn't be surprised that the oil level on the dipstick is difficult to read, but it looks like it's about at the ad line. We'll crack open a fresh bottle of oil to top it off, and looking again, we are right where we need to be. Which is great, because it took six and a half quarts to get there, exactly what the oil pan we based this one off of is supposed to hold. Finally having oil in the engine feels like a reasonably big milestone, and what better way to celebrate than getting to see what the supercharger looks like perched atop our 454. We'll lay down the base gasket and heft that problem child up onto his throne. To hold that in place, we've got these 6 inch long 7 16ths of an inch bolts, one for each corner. The back two go into the intake plenum, so they will need thread sealer eventually, but right now we're just doing a test fit. We'll snug each of those down and do something I have been dying to for a long time. Install the drive belt. With that draped over the toothed pulleys and tensioned on the idler, we can take our first good look at how this has all come together. It has been a monumental amount of work to get to this point, and looking at it now, it's clear that there are still some things to be done. Yeah, we were still waiting for supercharger parts while building the idler bracket so the dimensions were guesses, and I think I may have missed the mark a bit. Since the pulleys aren't the exact same width, I decided to measure this using the center line, and marking off of the driven pulley on the supercharger, this is the difference between its center line and the middle of the idler. That comes out to 0.30 inches, which is how much we're going to shorten the idler bracket standoffs. I really didn't want to take off that bracket again, but this seemed like the best way to fix that misalignment. We don't have enough threads in the intake manifold to leave the bolts the current length, so once we cut each and every one and sand the ends smooth, we're left with bolts that measure out to 4.475-ish inches. We'll need to give the same treatment to the aluminum standoffs we made. We'll use an aluminum cutting disc on the angle grinder to trim each one down, then finish them on the disc sander until they're the exact length we're looking for. Pretty soon we've got all five spacers cut to length, and we just need to reassemble the bracket. Once the bolts have been torqued back down to 30 foot-pounds, we can put back on the idler and check out its alignment. From what I can see, it looks pretty spot on. Okay, you got me, it wasn't quite there, and I actually took the bracket back off to stack 16th of an inch washers with the spacers to get it dialed in. Yeah, turns out the spacers are probably supposed to be three and three quarter inches long. I guess that makes more sense than 3.7, but uh, here we are. At least the alignment between the pulleys looks pretty close to perfect. Things are starting to come together, and it really feels like we're getting somewhere. Of course, we're still missing a pretty important system, and that's fuel delivery, which we'll be working on next time.